You're listening to the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. Where we talk about hunting, shooting, fishing, camping, and everything else that the great outdoors has to offer. Let's get into it. All right, I'm joined tonight by the new admin for Hunting Australia, uh, Graham David. Mate, thanks for coming on. We've been chatting about how much we're liking season two of Alone. It's good to see some hunters on there, isn't it? It's so good. Yeah, I've watched all the old ones. And then, yeah, we are just saying that that first uh, season wasn't the greatest for Australia, but now um, I think the rules are probably a bit more relaxed in New Zealand and, and they're getting into it. I'm keen as. Yeah. I, look, I that first season, just them not being able to hunt, <laughs> it just sort of really stopped what I feel alone was really about. And I love the American version. And, you know, as we were just talking about off air, saying that musk ox when he knocked that, uh, it's yeah. a game changer when you're out there. And this time, seeing them being able to, you know, episode three, came out last night and it was awesome to see Chase climbing up the mountain trying to, you know, track him down and he did burn yeah. a lot of calories heading up there, but, you know, it's worth it. That's the the roll of the dice that you want to take. Yeah. Just high risk, high reward. Like if you just down one of those things, you're just set for like the oh. next hundred or so days and you're just sitting on your ass just <laughs> just eating deer meat. A hundred percent. I think that that's the one for me. I'm just sitting there going – if you're one of the ones that can get lucky enough to knock one, you are, you've just put yourself at top of the pole. Like you are, yeah. you know, unless injury or something else or someone else is able to knock one too. And yeah. I hope that happens. And I, I, what I really like about this season so far is there's a good four or five hunters on there that are pretty avid sort of hunters out there. They love it. And that's why they yeah. wanted to go on there to test themselves. So I don't feel like they're going to be. I remember there was a contestant on the American one, Bebo or something like that, and he just – it was a big unit and his whole plan was I've got a lot of body fat. I'm just going to lay here and sort of yeah. lay, lay around. And I was like, that's not really surviving in in my sense. I want someone out yeah. there, you know, doing the hard yards and trying to really live off the land, not just sort of wait it out. Yeah, because they've kind of pre-prepared, like they're, they're building their fat stores before they get on there. And that was like the first Aussie one that they had, that lady. She was really good and like mentally just like strong as a rock. But she um, she did that, just just filled up, just got her fat stores in and then just chilled out for like the first week. And and then I think actually she ended up hitting a, a little like, I don't know, a little pot of roux or a patty melon or something with a rock. And um, and then she won it, you know, just, just off that one thing. Well, that was interesting last night when they uh, he used, I think, there was shovel to knock the brush tail possum off. Or, <laughs> oh, all right, if you, yep. <laughs> probably not the way people thought that they'd be out there hunting or getting food, yeah. but hey, do what you got to do out there. Yep. That that would be hard being on that yeah. show and oh yeah, say twenty days in without food and still having to abide by the rules and not. Just go. I'm. I'm starving. I need to take this animal out. And yeah, like I saw, they couldn't eat the eels that they were yeah. bringing in. So that was rough. But but then you think of the possum. Like to me, I'm like, how could you ever do that? And then I'm like, oh no, they're a pest over there. Like, they are. Yeah. New Zealand don't like them. It's it's weird. Like still to think of it as a nice little native animal, you got to look after it, and <laughs> they're just over there whacking them with shovels. Hundred percent. It's a bit different. It. Yeah, when when it happened, I saw that. I, it, you do have to sort of check yourself and go, oh, it's a possum. Oh, wait, yeah, it's over there. Introduced species. They don't want them there. Yeah. They're poisoning them. Like, okay, at least that one got used for meat. So Yeah, making purses and stuff out of them. Yeah, it's <laughs> different uh, Different strokes for different folks, isn't it? So, And, and it. every country does it differently. So, But, uh, yeah. mate, look, I wanted to get you on here because – I, you know, the new admin for Hunting Australia, it's the biggest group on Facebook for hunting. I love the group and I'm the admin for fellow deer hunters of Australia, which is probably about a quarter of the size of you guys because you're pr- pretty close, getting close to the 100K mark, which is bloody awesome. Yep. Um, you yeah. Know, 
So we wanted to have a chat and say, how did that all come about? Find out a bit about you so that if anyone out there didn't know about you who's sort of taken over and looking after the group now. So find out sort of your background in that and then pick your brain here because, man, we're going through a bit of a stage in my group of just some ordinary comments and people just not being supportive. And I'm not someone that will stand for that and I've taken a bit of a hard line, but – you know, yeah. I, I see the drama I'm having with 24,000 people or 25, whatever yeah. it is, uh, and then go, Jesus, you guys have got 100. That's a bit harder. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We, you can't talk about Hunting Australia group without mentioning Michael Gibson. Um, so I didn't know him personally. I'm not going to pretend I did. Uh, I did chat to him a couple of times and I, I followed his adventures, you know, like how couldn't you if you're into 100%. especially red deer hunting and and me and him, uh, I think we've come across the same animals a couple of times. And, and I think he actually shot one of the best ones I ever got on camera. So um, we, were, we were trading animals for a little bit there. Um, but, yeah, so he started it in, I think, uh, mid-2017. And, and from what I can gather from everyone I've spoken to, and I've gone back to the really early days of the group just to see, just to look at his posts and see what his – thoughts were and and what he wanted to do with it and I've kind of tried to gather a bit of his vision and and head in that direction as well so and he was a huge stickler for you know if you're if you're not for all hunting then you're out like and and I'm big on that I'm huge on people's rights you know if you've got the right to hunt and it's legal then then we show it um Facebook Facebook can get a bit picky with some things you can get especially I guess with um, pigs and dogs um, it, it gets a bit a bit of a weird area there um, Facebook's a bit temperamental with that stuff but other than that uh, I'm all for it and and so like I don't pig hunt it's just something I've never really done and grow up with it but it's legal uh, and we're hunting Australia so you can put it on there so we we sort of respect everyone's way of hunting and even if it's not particularly hunting like I'm all for if you're just culling as well, uh, just anything to do with the animals that we, we hunt, as long as you say that's what you're doing, yeah, everyone, we're all for it. So kind of tried to continue that tradition of his of, of just allowing everyone to come and show what they do. It doesn't have to be your thing, but uh, it's just their their way of hunting and their connection to hunting or to the land or to the animals or their traditions, whatever it is. Yeah, we're... We allow it, all of it. I like it. It's one of the things that, you know, what you were saying completely resonated with me and it's something I try and do. As long as it's legal, that's the big push for me, all right? If something comes through that I find is distasteful that I wouldn't do, that's fine. That's my opinion that it's distasteful. doesn't mean that someone else is putting it up that doesn't think that. So I'm the sort of same. I go, yep, let it through. I get some people don't like that or go, it's not a nice photo, et cetera. But then I go, look, it is a hunting group. It's not for the general public. It's a private group. So I don't have the issues with that. But it then starts to get a bit tricky with what you were saying exactly, which is the Facebook violations. And that is a really hard one to navigate because some of the things that get flagged, I sit there and go, well, there's a lot worse that has been put there, but that got flagged over that. So trying to navigate that because the last thing you do also want not to happen is such a great group get pegged or removed or suspended. So it's that really tricky balance of trying to have that free speech, which I'm all for, but then also- not letting scammers in, not letting things come through that are going to hurt the group too. It's yeah, yeah geez, it's a fine balance. It is for sure. And and I don't want to annoy people by not approving things. So and the big things like we've just come off three big flags um that have gone through Facebook and and that's why we've turned on the um approval post. You know, we never wanted to do that, but that was sort of done before my time because uh, I've been admining it for a while now uh, just to help out because my posts weren't getting uh, approved in there. And I was like, what's going on? And oh, we're flooded and, and they wanted a bit of help. So I was like, cool, I'll jump on. You know, some of those guys have been doing admin on that for, you know, 10 years. So, <laughs> you know, it's hard to keep up, you know, with 
with a hundred thousand people coming at you. So yeah, some of the stuff we get flagged for is weird. The the biggest one is Facebook thinking that you're selling firearms or ammunition. So yeah. I have to write back to people and just apologize to them and say, you know, I'm all for this, you know, I'm I'm keen as for it. But Facebook's gonna read this because you've said things like, Hey, I'm interested in this kind of ammo. It's this price at this shop. You know, what do you recommend and where should I buy it from? And then Facebook sees that, nah, you're you're buying and selling ammo and they flag it. And it's a big flag. It's it goes to, I don't know, higher up somewhere and you've got to try and contest it and you gotta hope that you'll win it. And if you get enough of them, uh, they'll shut your group down. And and it almost happened quite a while ago and then we got a couple more recently. So now every single post goes through me, every single new member. I watch everything because I'm so worried about it getting taken down. <laughs> like I'd hate for that to happen. Oh, it's a major concern and it's one I – look, I have the approve on because you can do your best to stop scammers getting through and, and whatnot and even people that shouldn't be in the group. But it's you – know, and some people get a little frustrated with the questions that are there and it's like I get where you're coming from, however – if you're getting strikes, you don't want the group just to disappear and you spend, yep. you know, you definitely would be like myself. You spend a lot of time and effort making sure the group is, you know, rolling and people's posts are getting approved and the content's good. You don't want to see it just get thrown away because it's taken a long time for you to get to that stage. I don't think people get that. And even the comments, like I've had a couple flagged for um, hate speech and it's not necessarily hate speech, but if you have an argument or say a name, you know, essentially it gets flagged and then yeah. the group gets a warning and then it's like, well, yeah. it's one individual. And the other thing, as you said, if you allow a post to get through and it somehow has something like I'm interested in selling this, then they strike that because the admin approved it as well. So it's a, yeah. a harsher hit. <laughs> it's just. Those ones are really big. Yeah. yeah I've. I've had the ones where they're like, oh, we removed this for harassment and bullying, but it's, um, I don't know if you can swear on here, but yeah, it's, just, it. yeah, it's just words that we use in the in our common uh, English language of, of telling people to pull their head in. And, and I find them funny. I find it great, but Facebook sees them in a different light and, and they think that you're, you know, you're going after someone, but really you're just having a bit of a dig and, and it's the way that we speak, but. Yeah, those ones I think um, are okay because Facebook removed it. But yeah, if you approve it and then it gets removed, that's a big one, and and they're the scary ones. That's the one that'll get your your site taken down. So and it's simple words, isn't it? Sometimes you sit there, and I had one, yeah. and the contesting is even that difficult. Like it's such a confusing, painful sort of thing to go, hey, there was nothing really in this. Yeah. And even some of the ones I've had flagged, but then I can't actually see the content because Facebook took it down. Yes. And you sit there and go, okay, well, what the hell was it? Because I might have 30, 40 posts a day, you know, more if I've gone out bush for a couple of days or whatever it is. And you sit there and go, well, I don't even know what post that was. It's not like you get one a day. And then it's yep. so difficult just to find out what the hell they'd actually flagged so you know for next time or what yeah, happened. Yeah, you can't learn. Yeah. Yeah, they've, I've seen that before as well. They hide it from you in the admin section and then you've got no idea how, like what what the picture was and then that's it. Yeah, it's you painful. Know? Yeah. How do you learn anything? No, it's- They're sort of um, – they are – against us in a bit a bit of a way i i understand that they've got their own agenda and and they want to keep things all you know pg or even g but yeah they i did actually read their terms and conditions and it does say that they are okay with hunting and and animals you know as long as you know the animal being shot or being butchered or whatever it is is within the context of hunting that is allowed so that kind of saves us a little bit but yeah the rest of it anything to do even with the other pay, uh, the group that we have, the trading post one, you know, you can't put up like, can't put up scopes, uh, you can't put up magazines. There's a, there's a huge list. You're not even allowed to do edge, what do they call it, like edge, something, you know, knives, blades, anything. It's like, well, this is hunting trading posts. Like all you can do is sell boots and camo gear, and that's about it. 
that's their rules, I guess. And you do have to play within the constraints of the system, unfortunately. And it's one I've spoken about on the podcast because I'm a big fan of Elon Musk and what he's done over there at X or the old yep. Twitter because that is not really regulated since he's took over because he sees what's sort of going on and he's even if it's not his cup of tea, he's all about free speech, which I love. But yep. People are just so addicted to, you know, the main ones, the Facebook, the Instagram. It's hard for people to jump across. And I get it, but I sort of it does concern me sometimes going, hey, these great groups with so much input and so much knowledge and people talking, it's just, they're invaluable in my sort of opinion. And they could just get gone. <laughs> that's yeah. that's scary, isn't it? Like easily. Yeah, and that, that definitely worries me. And that's why I'm probably a bit strict. I might sort of let off the brakes a bit in the coming months, but at the moment I'm quite strict and I'm, I just want it to run smoothly with no big flags or anything for a while. And then I'll, I'll start sort of slowly letting it off and just see how things go. But I'd say 95% of the stuff is getting through. It's just when people do really dumb stuff, you know, like, or things like they'll put up a photo of, of a you know a dog or something they shot and the, the whole face is missing and the, there's stuff everywhere and you're like I'm fine with that but you're like ah it's a tricky one because I'm fine with it but if that gets flagged like how am I gonna justify this like yeah okay it's hunting yeah but at the same time it doesn't look good <laughs> it's um it's a rough one so yeah it's a very hard minefield to navigate. And that's the one – I look, and I get it. If you haven't been an admin or you haven't dealt with that side of it, you just don't even think about it probably. So it's yeah, it's one of those things. I don't sit there and go, oh, you know, this person's deliberately trying to cause trouble for the group. I think it's just, you know, human nature. Hey, I shot this. Some people are really happy wanting to show off the fact that they can knock something from 100 metres and take out headshots. And yeah, I get that. That's – Decent. That's good shooting. I've got no issue with that. But then, the as you said, the image, oh, is that going to be something that gets flagged? And then you got to think about it. Is that the, the hill you want to die on for that image for the Facebook group to go? So it's, yeah. it's tricky. It worries me as well because I get some people, you know, I'm doing the same as you. I'm reading the questions and how people answer them and, and I'm looking at how long they've had their profile, what other groups they're involved in. Like I do a lot to to see who's coming in and I've seen a few lately and I'm like, oh, you you got Peter and you got RSPCA and you got this, but then you got these hunting groups and I'm like, oh, okay. I dig a bit further and I'm like, ah, oh, that's why you were coming in. You were coming in to look at these photos and and come after us or use them against us. You know, the, those people, and there's probably some of those people in the group now, like almost 100,000 people, yeah, who knows? It's They'd be hidden in there somewhere. But... Yeah, I'm trying to keep them out, but yeah, that's that's the other side of it. We've got to be careful of it is a private group, but there are people lurking for sure. Well, it is hard. I'm the same. I go through profiles and if there's no joint groups and uh, you can see when they've been made and I, you, you sort of have a squeeze through, but you're not going to get everybody. Like People can hide it quite well. Oh, yeah. And I had... I had a what I just put up one post and then another post. So within 23 hours, I had another 100 members that had been approved and probably another 60 that had been denied. Like, I can't, I can't keep on top of that many. Like, it just flies every day. And then if you use the admin assist version as well, where it, um, you know, oh, I use it because I've set some pretty strict sort of guidelines on it on how. It has to match up for them to get through and that sort of automatically does it. So I sort of felt very nervous about doing that at the start because I was like, well, I do like the fact that I can scan through it. But, you know, if they're getting if, – if they've got multiple groups and they've got multiple friends and it's – you know, you yep. can see that they're there, you can set that up nicely. But it is that – yeah, it's a hard one. It, you know, I, I don't yeah. think there's a, uh, a magic – bullet to fix all the problems and no. I think people have to be mindful of that that yeah a hundred thousand people is a lot of people to to monitor and there yeah. is probably quite a few in there that are in there to gather info or get those oh, yeah, pictures. There'd be, so there'd be DPI guys in there. There'd be 
you know, whatever the, I'm not sure the Victorian version is, but and there'd be police and there'd be all sorts of people in there looking. So, and I remind people of that, like you gotta, you gotta be a little bit careful. It's not a, it's not the wild west in here. Like we do have to keep a bit of an image, but yeah, I turned the, um, admin assist off for letting new people in. I look at every person, but you can turn it on for posts. So, uh, at the moment I have everything has to be approved, but then admin assist is allowing some posts through. So, uh, and that's, I eventually want to get it to the point where I'm just adding people to a list like, oh no, I've seen you've done five good posts. You know, you can just post whenever you like now and just start letting people who are consistently good, uh, and putting up really good quality stuff and just let them do their thing in there and, and not annoy them with having to wait for their stuff to get approved. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, I'm pretty quick on it, but at the same time, like I've got a day job, so I can do it at lunchtime and in the arvos and night. But yeah, I, I like the idea of getting your post up there really quickly. It's way more fun. You're excited to share it, yep. so I don't want you to wait around. Yeah, no, 100% I agree. So, mate, let's get into you. What What's your hunting background? Let's talk about your journey. Yeah, so I started a bit later in life, and I think this is happening. I've seen quite a few people do this, uh, write about it on the on the group as well. As like my nan and and my dad were both into hunting, and they used to go out sort of west of Sydney. This is back in maybe sixties and seventies when you could just catch a train with the gun and go shoot some rabbits on some random just free land, and, and then just bring them home on the train. Oh, the good old like, days, yeah, like. <laughs> You were just allowed to do that. So um, they used to do that and they had a little uh, Lithgow 22 and used to go out and shoot them. And yeah, years, I, I think, I don't know how old I was, but in my 20s or something, we, we went and did a, um, a family uh, clay target shooting. We thought, oh, that was pretty fun. Maybe we'll we'll get our license and do a bit of clay target shooting and got our licenses. And then we, we saw you, you could go out into the state forest and we're like, oh, that's cool. You know, we've been ball driving and camping out there before let's let's book in and do that so we did all the r license and all that stuff and then so me my dad and my brother yeah went out and just started just being uh just learner straight up fresh um state forest hunters just making all the the stupidest mistakes you could ever think of and like our first trip was we turned up to vulcan state forest pretty Pretty famous one for for people just starting out, you know, quite quite close to Sydney or one of the closer ones. So we rocked up there and it started to snow. Um, we saw a guy drive past us with his number plates blacked out. We didn't know what that was about. And then we went in and um, my brother, I think he he brought the right gun and the bolt, but brought the wrong ammo. So he he left his stuff and then um, we walked in and. He was using my gun as a like as a binocular because we didn't have any binoculars. So he's looking through the scope, and then we're yelling at him because we actually saw two deer, and he's looking at them. But I've got the magazine in my pocket, you know, like just just absolute amateurs. Um, but yeah, then then after seeing those two deer, we on our very first trip, we we're like, this is it. This is what we want to do now, and that that just kicked it off for us. So we did that for, for quite a few years. Just the state forest, all west of Sydney. Loved it and got really, really into it. And just really like the idea that it's just land that, you know, if you get your license or even if you get a bow, you just do that R license online. Uh, I think you do it online or we did it at a club and, and you're good to go. Like you can just go and you can just spend your life in there just finding animals. You know, you can, you can get crazy or you can just drop in and, do a bit of a weekend warrior and go with your mates and have a good camp and yeah it's just i just like the idea of just free land like that to just go and spend your time in i am a massive fan of it that i don't know how people in queensland do it with no public land yeah i am envious of the mexicans down there in vic because they just if it's huntable they can just walk off into it which is just yep. i see how amazing that could be instead of booking because you know, there's been plenty of times I've booked or, you know, we have to get up at midnight to try and get the forest in the rut and we've all yep. probably been there and, and whatnot. And compared to, you know, in Victoria, just being able to go out and if it's huntable, 
you just can walk off and and you're in there. That I think that's awesome. I get the reasons why and whatnot, and I think we're very lucky to have public land as well. So it's pretty cool though that oh yeah, you're able to really get amongst it and and even just even just for going out there like now that i've done it and i know some of these forests like nothing else i I even just tell my friends i'm like you know you can just go there like you can just go drive around you can camp there you can do whatever like it's as long as you're not stupid or doing anything too silly like it's just land to use like just go enjoy it go mushroom picking or just go take photos of stuff like yeah, it's not even just hunting. It's just land for people to use. And, and so much of it, like when I first started, I thought, oh, it's all just the pine forest, you know, it's just blackberries and pine forest. And then you get deeper and then you're like, oh, hang on, like you're getting into some of these other forests and, and there's just acres and acres and hundreds of thousands of acres of just, just Australian bush with animals in there, like incredible. That, that that's just available. Yeah, it's cool. I always just think how lucky we are that we've got it and I'd hate to see us lose it in the future because if, yep. you know, a lot of listeners, a lot myself, they reach out and talk about it, that they just don't have private access and they haven't been able to sort of achieve that, which is, it, it's a tough slog out there. I know I've been going for uh, what, five, six years now and, and still try to be as, I guess, um, what's the word is uh, – trying to be as innovative as possible to catch the <laughs> eye of farmers. And I yep. mustn't be that creative because <laughs> it's not working. But uh, I'll help you out. That's, I'll that's help just, you out. Mate, it's, lo- it's just part of it. Eh? I, I'd yep. not – like it's frustrating because I'd love to have something closer because with a young family, it's hard to get away a lot. And if yep. you'd had something closer, it'd be awesome. I'd love that. But I sort of yeah. then also sit there and go, hey, it is what it is. I'm lucky enough to have public land, whereas people in Queensland don't and they have to travel a lot further. So I get that understanding of it and it's cool to hear. I've got a, a couple of mates who I've met through the podcast and they have picked up private land and even today, like it's been a great day today. Um, my mate Dan, who – was there when I got my first deer. He took us to his private access for the whole journey just to see it, and, and which was awesome. Yeah. This is the first time I've seen that whole journey of, of meeting farmers and, and whatnot. And he uh, he got his first deer. He knocked a fallow doe off this morning, and I was super excited for him. We've been talking about him getting out to this private block he has. And then he also, I get a message about an hour later with a picture of a buck. So he's got two on the first time. Oh, man, it's awesome. So, Dan, well done, buddy. I can't wait to hear the story tomorrow morning. Uh, But, yeah, I sit there. That makes me super happy that, you know, he's put in a lot of time and effort and that was his thing was I'm going to go after private because young family too doesn't have the time to get out to the public land and and have that travel. He's got it. He's been able to do something I haven't and good on him. I'm so happy for him and it's paid off now. And, yeah, it's just those stories keep me sort of motivated to keep trying different things and, and whatnot. And, it, look, it is what it is, but I love the fact that I can just get out to those state forests and have yeah. a go and just explore somewhere new. Like I've done both now and, like, I don't know if I've got the gift of, of the gab or something, but... I, I do have quite a few private places now and, and I've found them in all different ways. The only one I never do is I never door knock because that I I just wouldn't enjoy that if someone came to my place. I'm, I'm a bit private like that. but And it works for some people and that's fine, but I just I couldn't do it. I couldn't go knock on someone's door. <laughs> I don't know. I just Maybe I don't have the confidence to do that, but some people do and good on them, but yeah, like I, I still think the state forest, like the first year I ever shot was just like a yearling, just like a real little tiny thing, you know, you just, just pick it up with one arm and it was nothing. But that to me is like so much more because it is, it seems like it's truly free range. You, even though private property, you know, you, they're, they're free range on there too. Um, you know, the, the fences aren't very high and they jump over them or they cross the river and, some of the places that I have back onto state forest, so you know they're coming in and out, and it, it's just whoever's there at the time gets it. But 
shooting it in a state forest has a different feel to it. It's, I don't know, I, th- I think it's more of an achievement. I don't know whether it is or not, but it feels like it is. I would agree. I mean, I've said it I've said it on the podcast, the first year I got was on the private block. It was a Rusa, and we went for not even a 10-minute walk, found him, snuck in, shot, done. And I was just like, <laughs> yes. okay, uh, didn't feel like hunting. It felt yeah. like just shooting. And, and look, the principles were the same and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. I would actually say it was – it was more like hunting because you had bushland and it did feel that way a little, but it just felt easy. Too easy. Yeah. yeah. And then I've got a couple in the state forest now and they have been a lot harder and it's been a lot longer journey, but that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's I don't I, – I would love the mix and I'd love the mix yeah. more to have that private block to have that steady stream of venison because I'm all about the self-sufficiency and – it was awesome the other night. We had the, you know, one of the first times that it just sort of coincided that the whole dinner was everything out of our veggie garden and the meat wow. was the venison. And that yeah. is cool. My kids all ate it, you know, and they're like 18, two, my twins are 18 months and my, my son's three and a half. And they were sitting there and the next night they wanted more venison. And it was like, yeah, this is, this is what I want. This is awesome. Yeah. So I'd love to have that steady stream and the state forest doesn't mean that's going to happen because I've got a couple, you know, I've got two now and two different state forests and one was the first time I was in one. So I'm starting to go, hey, it's coming together, which I love. But I I would love the fact if I had that steady stream of venison as well as the state forest. I wouldn't give up state forest because I love the challenge of a state forest. That's exciting, exploring new property finding things. I like that. That's not, you know, I wasn't even upset when I, uh, I like to hunt Moragul North. That's one of my favorite forests. I love the snowies. And when I went down there, there was just people everywhere. And it, the camp spots that I sort of go to were packed. And I just went, well, okay, I'm going to try something else because I booked a second forest. I said, I'm going to go try try that. First time there, just exploring. I had a great time. Like it wasn't, yeah. I wasn't upset going, damn it, these people are, are there. No, I, I liked getting into that other forest. And yeah finding new places it's it's awesome and and that's the beauty too like of being able to do that so i I feel very lucky yeah and i think that's where some of the achievement comes from is that it's sort of like it's a real world version of you versus all the other guys who's going to get the deer who's going to get the pig and it's it's more of a a real life because it is public you know if it if it's private it's it's you versus the animal maybe one or two other guys that have got access and that's about it, um, which doesn't diminish the hunt at all. But I just think when it's public land, it's just like it's a free-for-all and if you get it, you get it. You know, you are you were the best on the day and, yeah, I like that. It's a lot more realistic if maybe if shit hit the fan, um, that's how it would be. <laughs> like a walking dead scenario. Yeah. I, I look at it and go, it's like the stars have to align in this beautiful way that you are in the forest, that the it comes together, that no one else has been able to take that animal off that public land. And the forests I hunt down the snowies are pretty popular. So you know they're getting hit all the time. So there's a lot of opportunity for other hunters to get those animals before you do. So when you do get there and you're seeing them it is almost i get excited just seeing them down there because i'm like okay these things are on edge because they know they're getting hunted and hunted pretty hard and i'm still able to get within that range to see them or shoot them that's that's awesome like it's i think it's all part of it i i don't know i i'm a bit sort of romanticism of the whole thing of just being out in the bush and enjoying your time exploring and putting yourself up against nature and, and these amazing animals like that. It's And then you get to know those forests as well. Like I haven't been out. I, I then after sort of Vulcan then ended up hearing that Pennsylvania was a good forest and I thought, oh, that's got a crazy name. Like let's head out there. And I ended up getting really in tune with that. Uh, it was the eastern side of it. It's all logged now but that eastern side of it, any time I could go there, I could get a deer. 
every single time. I just knew where they were going to be at what time. And I did every single time we went. My brother hadn't got one and I was like, let's book it in. We went for a camp. And I was like, let's go. Walk down, bang, got one. Just like, like it was so good. And even though it was easier, it, it still felt as good because you'd put the work in, you learnt the forest, and it's almost like you achieve that level of, cool, you know, I can, I can go in here and I know how this place works and I'm really in tune with it. Um, so that was nice. I, I really enjoyed that. And then they started logging it and pushed everything out. That was the end of it. Back to scratch. <laughs> I like the idea of knowing a forest. Now, that's where I really went wrong in my earlier sort of hunting career is that I didn't go to a forest more than twice. I was yep. sort of going to new forests and it was all about exploring and, and learning and just getting my hands dirty and getting out there. And no, I wouldn't take it back because I thoroughly enjoyed that. But I noticed the difference when I just went, all right, let's spend a bit more time in one forest and start to understand what's going on and put it together, put those puzzle pieces together. That made a big difference and it started to feel a lot easier. Not saying it's easy, but saying it, it started to feel a lot easier that when I was going there, knowing where the deer would probably be getting onto them or, you know, seeing them, et cetera. That was probably one of those things. So that's been a good thing. A mate of mine or a listener that's now a mate, and shout out to Johnny, his goal is to hunt every single state forest. And he gives it a really good crack. (laughs) I'll tell you that. He's done a lot. And he's pretty damn successful in there. He's going to come on the podcast at some stage. Um, I'm hoping actually it'll be a, a live one in hunt camp for his birthday. But we talk about that and he likes exploring and just getting to that new forest and checking them out and that's cool too. I, I mean, and this is the thing. Everyone hunts for different reasons and has different appeals to it. And as I said, and I, I know you're on board because you said it before, as long as it's legal, go for it. Like that's yeah. do what makes you happy within yep. the confines of the law. Like go for it. That's awesome. It's your style. It's your passion. It's your love. And it keeps you happy. It keeps you fit and motivated. Go for it. I, I, all the power to you. Like. I see these bow hunters and I'm like, man, you are insane. Like I've got a neighbour that bow hunts the state forests. He's pretty successful with it. I think he's crazy, but I love it. Like I'm probably not going to do it. I've got a bow. I can't spend the time mucking around with it to get good enough. Maybe it'll be something I do later in life, but now I'm the same. I've got young kids. I don't have time to do that. So I'm, I'm off riding bikes and stuff instead. So and I just love that he loves it that much, but it's not for me. You know, it's it's his it's his style, it's his thing. Uh, I couldn't imagine stalking into an animal for two hours and then just have it run away. You know, <laughs> and he'll do that, and he's fine with it, and and that's awesome. But I I couldn't do that. Not not yet. Maybe I need to be a bit older and need some more patience or something. But. I'd need to be a far better hunter. I've got the bow and I've got good with the bow because I practice a lot. I'm lucky enough that I can do that here where I live, but I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm definitely not a good hunter to get out there and do that. Like, there's no hope. I think the rifle. It's it just. I was talking to a mate and he got his first two the other week. It's been a good rut for a lot of new hunters, which has been awesome, and I love seeing what's coming about and what's happening. It's got me so pumped for the next trip. And he has taken five years to get his first two. So good on Sam, uh, mate, so good. But that's yeah. dedication, five years with the bow. And we went hunting together and he was there when I got my first state forest deer. And I was saying to him, because he never even looked like you know, releasing an arrow because they were just never that close. And I, I was like, man, you've got to get a gun. Like, I, I, I like the bow side, but man, like you could be amongst it right now and you could have had your first, but you, yep. you've got the bow. But uh, hey, more power to him. It's paid off and he's got two. It's, a, yeah. a, I think, a much bigger accomplishment than what I've done. So good on him. Oh, yeah. Like he's setting the bar high. So it's like, yeah, you just got to, you might have to wait longer for that achievement. But man, it's it's a hell of an achievement. If you're if you're state forest bow hunting, like 
yeah, you that's that's right up there. That's that's some hard work. Oh, hundred percent. Is it just deer chase mate, or is there a bit more? How did because no, some of those forests really? have got pigs and things in there, haven't they? Yeah, I'm I'm not really too fast. I I love the deer the most, and I'm big into reds at the moment. And I've got two properties uh, that I'm I'm pushing really hard on the reds with, and I'm trying to understand them. They're they're way harder than the fallow. I thought they were hard to learn, but now now they're they're not too bad. I can sort of can kind of get around what they're doing and and how to get them, but uh, the reds are just different you know i i thought being so big that they would just be so loud and so obvious and it's exactly the opposite they are impossible to find and and they hear the slightest noise and they are out of there um so yeah they're my that's my big focus at the moment but you know just during the rut uh one property you know she wants us to the farmer wants to sort of maintain the deer herd she's just got uh reds and a couple of fallows so uh, we were going out in the rut looking for them. We we didn't find anything, and we just came across some pigs. So we just shot them instead because it's it's kill on site for pigs. So they're just wrecking her land at the moment. So I'm, I'll take anything. I've obviously got my preferences, but uh, it also depends on the property. Some of them are just um, you know take out. They've all got different rules. One of them is every fallow just just shoot every fallow you can find. Um, they've got trees on there uh, like fruit trees and they wreck the trees so anything i can find i take out and and i'll even do it where i hunt during the day as soon as it turns night i then turn into sort of um, pest control version and i'll I'll spotlight or thermal i'll do whatever i need to do because some of these properties you've got to put numbers on the board uh, otherwise you know it's a waste of time for them because they're they're booking you in and and they're moving animals around for you and things like that and for you to get in there. And, you know, it's a, it's a free agreement. You know, I don't pay to go on any of them. Um, it's sort of an exchange my time for me to come and help them out because it's not something they want to do. So, yeah, so follow their rules a little bit. Um, that's where I don't always want to, but sometimes you've got to do that. Um, so, yeah, and, and anything like I, just hunting, you know, just seeing my dad, you know, he still takes out his little Lithgo 22 with us and he's in his 70s now and um, and he'll he'll pop a rabbit if he sees one, things like that. We still shoot foxes. My first big uh, animal out of a state forest was a goat. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really care too much. I don't let much walk. If it's feral, uh, it goes, except for the deer. I, I will let deer walk. If they're young, um, or if I'm just not interested in taking something, I'll let them go. But everything else has a target on it. Um, yeah. I'm sort of, I guess, a, a little bit uh, sort of want to get rid of the ferals, I guess. Um, I don't think the deer in managed numbers really hurt the environment too much. I think once you get big herds, you get 100 or 200 of them running through, they're going to they're gonna wreck some stuff. But yeah, I, I don't like the pigs. I don't like the way they, they rip up the ground. I don't like the foxes, you know, killing native animals. Um, one of our best posts actually on the group, you, you might have seen it, it, it almost went out to every single member uh, with some great trail cam footage that a guy got of two big eagles yep. fighting a, a fox oh, off, a, off a lamb carcass. Man, like... I just loved those pictures so much. It's just so Very iconic, cool. and I just thought this this is why you do it. You know, like you just don't you just don't want that competition between the ferals and the natives. I really like our native animals, and that was that was goes one of the motivating factors for getting into hunting is is to give them a bit more of a chance and try and get out some some numbers. I agree. I think I would be up there with trying to get cats. Probably as one of the highest. If if I see a state forest, if I'm out in the state forest, I don't care if it's the rut. If I see a cat, it's gone. Just the damage they do. I've only ever seen one and it was a bit of a stretch and my brother took a shot at it and missed it. Uh, and that's the only cat I've ever seen on state forest. And that was in Pennsylvania a long time ago. Uh, and that's the only one I've ever seen in, in private or or state forest, but yeah. yeah, I'd be the same. Uh, yeah, it's just not on my list because I just don't 
but yeah, that was probably six years ago, you know, the last one I saw. Maybe it's just the places that I hunt uh, just don't have them much, which is good. Uh, but yeah, I'm the same. I, I don't like cats. I, I like cats, you know, if they're inside. Yeah. I don't like cats roaming the streets or yeah, I'm not a, <laughs> not a fan. It's th- That's an interesting one, isn't it? I still get very sort of perplexed at how that works is you've got to keep dogs sort of constrained, but everyone yep. just has this sort of, not everyone obviously, but a lot of people have the, oh, the cats, that's just what they do. They're cool to jump the fence and go into other people's na- like yards and go out into the bush. Yeah. And it's like if, if that was a dog, people would be probably up in arms, especially a, yeah. a scary dog. Um, you know what I mean? It's, I don't and they get are, it. Like I live up in the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney, and we're a, we're a world heritage area and basically can't do anything here. You can't, you can't shoot, you can't hunt, you can't, you can't even walk in the bush without rules and regulations and we just have cats walking around. And you think to yourself, like, how is this okay? Like we bait, we bait for feral dogs, we bait for the foxes, and yet we just have these cats, which we know just eat so many native animals. And for some reason, we're okay with it. I don't get it. I think maybe a lot of greenies own cats and somehow they've kept the legislation away from themselves. I don't know, but someone got away with something somewhere. Yeah, 100%. They sort of fly under the radar uh, compared to other species. For, For a species that definitely has such an impact on native animals and the amount they kill, and they actively kill a lot, it always sort of makes me wonder when you talk about like the deer and the brumbies sort of get a bigger pass, uh, even though they're bigger, you know, have bigger hooves. And where I hunt in the snow is, Jesus and brumbies down there. Oh, my God, they're everywhere. And you can see they do so much more damage than the deer. But yeah. they still, there's so much support to keep them there for whatever reason. and Because oh, there's poems about them. Yeah, that seems to be the, you know, it's they're part of our culture. And I understand where people are coming from. And I don't want to see them removed from the landscape. I think, as you said before, manage the numbers. You don't, yeah. I, I don't want to see herds of 100 deer running around the joint. Like that's, that's not good. But no. small amounts that people can sustainably use – that has to be a win. And yep. even horses, I, I really hate the fact that Ariel culling the horses. That's such a waste of good meat. And it I'm is. sure there's plenty of people that would be more than happy to take that meat. I'd be one of them. Yep. I'll put my hand up there. And for whatever reason, I don't get why we sit there and go, hey, just shooting them out of a, a helicopter or whatever way we're going to go about it. But it's just such a waste of a resource. It blows yeah. my mind, especially in the current climate of inflation going through the roof and people struggling out there. It makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. And and other countries have, have programs for it. Like I know America has the Hunters for the Hungry and they and you can donate, you know, mostly deer and and pigs to that. But and that makes total sense. I think here it's a little bit harder because it's not ingrained in our uh, I guess in in probably white culture, I'm thinking of to to eat these animals. A lot of other countries, you know, they, they love things like that. Like when I, I did a boys' trip to Japan, and we actually ate raw horse, uh, and it was great. It yeah. was is just meat with sauce on it. Like it just tastes like nothing else. Yeah. And then I sort of thought, like, yeah, like that seemed really exotic to me. But I thought there's probably people out there that just eat this as just Sunday dinner, like it's just no worries, and, and I guess goats slowly moving into that a little bit. Like feral pig will will always, I think, be on the outside, as where you know domesticated pigs will, will always be okay. They're just a little bit riskier, I guess. But yeah, like that culling is is crazy. That I understand. I I was actually talking to a, a farmer the other day because it was the rut, and I was I was booking stuff in with with them to go out there. And they said, just letting you know as well, they are aerial culling out here through the whole rut. And I thought, oh, what an interesting time and how well they've lined that up. Like local land services getting out their helicopter and, and just blasting everything right all around the state forest, all around the edges, all through it, right when it's 
peak rut time for hunters. Great. You know, this isn't going to help. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand where that comes from because it does happen every year that it aligns and there's an aerial culling program around the rut. And that is the most active time that hunters are out there. So I get people go, oh, recreational hunters don't make as much of a dent, which I would argue the opposite. But anyway, when you are having the best time for them to be out there, why would you not do it afterwards or Mm -hmm. let them do their thing? It doesn't cost any money. It's going to actually be valuable for the economy, especially those rural remote sort of towns as well. You are sort of not pissing off hunters, but you are definitely upsetting them and frustrating them. And that's, I just don't get why the timing is like that. The only thing I can put it down to is that a lot of the shooters for these guys are doing it because they also want some heads. And that is the reason they want to be out there too. That's the only thing I can think of because it makes zero sense the time when hunters are in the bush to be aerial culling and shutting parts of the forest down and things like that and even on private properties makes no sense to me. So it has to be something like that from my guess. I'm not sure either. Like I can understand and I was talking to her about it. She said, oh, they've got, you know, 40 deer from around here and and he said, oh, that's a bit of a bugger, she said, but they did get, you know, 200 or so pigs. And I thought, yeah, that is that is probably pretty good because those pig numbers, I don't think with how fast pigs grow that, that us hunters can really keep them under control by ourselves. Like they are – one place I had trail cam footage and they were just babies and then I think I shot the same ones uh, the other week and they weren't babies anymore like they just grow so fast and just breed so quickly and so Um, many of them they breed so quick early too like yeah it's from like six months or something it's It's, ridiculous yeah so i i can kind of get a little bit on board with that in that okay like maybe and i don't think that's really going to hurt our hunting for pigs much i I think they're going to come back fine so i think they're just keeping numbers under control but I think deer, I, I don't think they're really surveying how many are in there and thinking, oh, you know, let's keep this kind of number. I think they're just thinking the more we shoot, the more funding we get, the, you know, the, the longer we can keep our jobs or whatever it is. I don't, I don't think there's any pre-thought of recreational hunters at all. And, and there might, may even be some negative actions towards us, you know, cause yeah, I can't think of a reason why you would, why you would shoot during the rut. Uh, they would know, you know, they, they know what's going on. I would it love is- to see some sort of model where we get into places we don't currently have access for a fee. National parks, I'd love to be able to charge money and put that money towards helicopter culling of pigs because yeah. they're a different kettle of fish. You talk about a deer will have one offspring and that'll be every 12 months. Uh, the pigs are pumping out a lot more of that. As you said, they get to a breeding age a lot quicker. So then they're reproducing. So the numbers aren't just doubling each you know, potential season. They can be well and truly exacerbated from there. But we seem to, yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather, and, and as you said before about people eating pigs, that's a very hit and miss sort of topic and subject. Some people have no problems whatsoever doing it. Others have much like, no, I'm not going to touch it. And hey, each their own, I get it. I'll put my hand up and say, I'm probably on the I won't eat them uh, category. I just think it's too much risk for for me. And if anyone else does it, hey, good luck to you. That's fine. It's your call, your life. Uh, But I would definitely like to see more conservation money be raised by recreational hunters by giving us opportunities to say, hey, you like chasing deer. You use the meat. You, here's some good areas because down here in Sydney, mate, through Wollongong, through the Royal <laughs> National Park, yep. man, I've seen some amazing animals. And like 20 years ago, I've you know driving through the National Park of a night and seeing some stags in there that were just monsters. Yep. And I sit there and just go, why haven't we got access here? What is going on? 
that it's public land that's locked up. There's animals there they want removed, but hey, we'll we'll cull them from a, a chopper or we'll do ground shooting of them, which that makes zero sense to me. If you can ground shoot, yeah. why are you paying someone to ground shoot when yeah. you can put someone in there? Because all you're doing is you're putting up a sign. I've seen the signs. I've been there when they've put the signs up saying there's ground shooting going on in this area. Okay. Yeah. Why can't a hunter do that? Like it's going on in Victoria. They go on public land. There hasn't been accidents. Here in New South Wales is the same. Touch wood. It's all good. What are we doing? Why are we so adverse to, you know, looking at some ideas like this as a, you know, society? It's crazy in my opinion. Yeah. No, I, I think that it's mostly an emotional thing and it's it's a really hard sell that a politician uh, will like. There's always the minor parties that will push stuff like this for us, but higher ups uh, or bigger parties have no interest in it because it's it's too much of just a big red flag and a big miss a, bi- a big mess for them you know oh the you know this politician he thinks it's a good idea to let people just shoot guns in our state forest and murder animals you know like that's how they'll that, yeah the terminology and persuasive language that hits yep. that you know emotions yeah yeah, and it gets everyone on board, oh, this is bad, you know, as where if you really uncover the actual story, which no one ever does, is that, no, we're actually, you know, interested in the conservation of these areas or maybe we're not, maybe we just like hunting. You know, who, who cares what your, your reasoning is for it? I'm, I'm more interested in the output of there's money in the bank, there's less animals that are feral in our national parks. And, and that's the outcome. And I don't really care how we get there. I just, yeah, I'd love recreational hunters to be able to do that. But yeah, they, they're not interested in it. I, I don't think they care. I don't think they care that the animals go to waste. I don't think it bothers them. As long as it's off their hands and they can just say, oh, we hire professionals. Um, you know, professionals look after, they love that word. The difference between a professional and amateur is you just put an invoice in. You know, <laughs> you might have the years of experience and the gear and all that stuff, but that's the main difference is, is you're just paying someone to do a job. And, you, and yeah, that's the other way around is, is we could pay them. Like if you're looking at going on a guided hunt and, and looking at the fees you'd have to pay for some of the heads that you get on there and then you look at what you'd get out of a state forest, like people will pay for it, obviously. So let them do it. It'd be a, a huge money maker. Oh, yeah. And then just, I don't think people, well, I think it's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow as having that as ecotourism. That yeah. the idea of killing animals, whether it's for meat or fun, they still see it as that sort of like the when the word sport is used, it gets yeah. a lot of people's backs up. And they don't understand the side of it because they've never been hunting. And let's be honest, the people that you're trying to change the opinions of that are so strongly against it, they have never stepped foot out hunting in the bush. They think it's super easy. They think it's cruel. And you're not probably going to change that. Although I will say I have had a lot of conversations with a lot of people who were very anti-hunting and once they heard why I hunt and talk through it, then they understand the respect of, you know, respect for the animal and that I don't yeah. want to see any animal suffer. And I talked about I don't want cats on the landscape. I still don't want to see cats suffer when they're shot or whatever yeah. way they're dispatched. Yeah. And I think that people miss that. And even when they attach the word sport to it and or trophy hunting or whatever they call it to try and – you know, have that persuasive language to have that negative connotation. They're not thinking about like the whole thing that most hunters, and I really truly believe that the majority of people are ethical hunters and that they don't want to see any animal suffer. And for me, that's, that's what we've got to promote and push more. And it's a tricky thing. It's a very tricky thing because everyone has a different perspective or perception and we spoke about it earlier with photos getting put through or how people what they want to do there are some that I would sit there and go I would never publish this in a public forum because if aunties or just general public saw this it's going to leave a bad taste in the mouth and 
maybe tarnish hunters. And hey, again, you do you. I'm all for that. But I like to approach it and go, I want to put stuff out there that is going to highlight respect and the ethical side of hunting to promote us in a good light. And I think the more people that will do that, the more inroads we'll make to being able to do things in the future. And hey, we may never, but it can't hurt, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing is people, when we put up photos and we show people our hunts or our videos, they are just seeing the end result, which is as hunters, that's what we want to see because we know that it was hard for you to get there. We already know that bit. And so we want to show off, you know, the fruits of our hard work uh, and we all get that and we all respect it. You know, someone puts up a state forest animal they took everyone writes on there like awesome you know congratulations on your first deal or pig or whatever it is because you know how hard that was for you to get uh, so you know difficulty for that achievement the general public doesn't know that at all and they will watch those videos of headshot compilations or or people just shooting a deer and they think that's what you do you you go out to the place you shoot the animal and then you high five your friends and you drink beers and then that's it, <laughs> you know. Like, and and it's so hard to capture all the rest of it, you know. And and I've had the same thing, friends or family, sort of think like, you know, it's a bit it's hunting, it's a bit crazy, and and all this. And, and then I'll tell them about my trip, and I'm like, oh, I just went out with the family, and and we, you know, did a vegan hunt today where we just walked around and we looked at stuff, and <laughs> and you know, came back and like, I think for state forests, I, I'd probably be. Yeah, still around the 90% of the time, I took nothing and I was going a lot. And to think that someone is bloodthirsty or just likes killing things or injuring things or, or just wants to be cruel, for you to go out and not do that 90% of the time, it just doesn't make any sense. You've got to have more pure motivations to go and just wander through the bush and and look at things and hope to see something. And then if you don't, you come home happy still. You couldn't do that with anything negative in your mind. It's got to be a, a good thing. Yeah. I mean, even if you go out there and you're armed bushwalking, it's not a bad thing. It's it's no. just great to get into the bush, just be immersed in that culture, it just turns that in, history. I see this every single time I see someone put up photos of like, kangaroos and like nature photos with flowers and stuff and i'm like yeah that was an unsuccessful hunt for sure because like that's <laughs> you've been I following did. my instagram have you? <laughs> yeah yeah but i think everyone does the same thing you're just like man i've been sitting here for an hour and i haven't got anything so you're like zooming in on this like really cool spider's web with like the morning dew on it like everyone has that same photo like yeah, yeah you're just sitting there just chilling out just admiring what's around you yeah, I think. And, and that's the hard thing is like people just don't get to see that. And and I wish they did, but unless they came out with you, um, I don't think they ever would. And sometimes they don't see the other things where I'll just go out and, and we'll just see some deer sometimes and I'll just take a photo of them. And that's super satisfying. Um, my other thing that I love doing is just checking game cameras. Like I'm huge on trail cameras. Like if I don't if I don't see anything or get anything, I'm like I just can't wait to get to my cameras and just get the photos on my phone and just see what was there, you know, what's what's around, what's possible. Like I I love that so much. So what do you run with your trail cameras? I was having this chat with Ian from the Hunters Campfire when we recorded and I am a fiend for wanting the video. I don't usually go the pictures, I go the video yeah. because I will sit there and almost make – I've got a couple of compilations here that I'll probably never post anywhere just for me to watch. Uh, just I love watching them move in their own environment with no one there. That's cool. Yeah, that's actually – yeah, that's actually inspired me a bit now I because I'm photo only because what I was doing was going to State Forest and I'd leave them up for three months and come back. So I could only have it take photos or just run out of battery or – run out of memory too quick so um yeah now that i've got some private spots and there's not as much movement of of ruse or things like that and i can get out there more often like most of my places are within an hour of my house so 
I think I might switch over now and start doing video because it does. That actually accidentally happened once and I got some good footage of like just a nice buck, just a fallow buck, just stamping his front foot. And I was just sort of wondering like, why is he doing that? You know, what's he communicating? But with a photo, I would have missed that. And and that's something I think I could get a lot more information out of it if I changed that over. So yeah, I, I might do what you're doing now. Well, that, and I also think it's a bit of an incentive to get back out and get them more often. Yeah, and true. switch them over. Like I have a couple out and I just leave them out. And then I'll I'll take the memory card and just batteries and just do a straight swap. But yep. I've also found, depending on the cameras, I've had some really good luck with getting a decent amount of um, memory on the card, like a, a bigger one. Um, and I tend to look for that in cameras. In I'll pick one that will be able to handle a the big, like a decent sized card, to be able to get more. And I've actually found that the batteries and things haven't been that bad. They're hit and miss. I've had a couple that they're just rat shit <laughs> the battery will last nearly, nearly two weeks and it's almost done you sit there and go what the hell like, there's there's nothing here i don't understand how this is even working but uh some of the others you just i had one out for months and video no issue and i got out there and it wasn't depleted enough to really change it was sort of like the halfway symbol was there and i was like this is bloody good uh, no. i thought it'd be dead but it wasn't yeah. it's but, yeah, I mean, they're all different. Same brand on another one didn't go as long. So it's it's a tricky yeah. sort of one. But I do like the idea of just seeing it. I've caught some cool footage of some Samba, you know, a stag that just the way they move and yep. that was amazing to watch. Very yeah. different animals compared to Fallow. Fallow are you know, sort of like the Labrador of the deer world, I think. Like they're just <laughs> they I'm watching them just bounce around and, you know, fluff about and the Samba are just like this stalking sort of – they're almost like a predator. I sort of watch yeah. them and it makes sense that they're stalked by tigers because they sort of move like a damn tiger sometimes. Like some of the footage I've got, I just sit there and go, wow, that's – Really switched on. Yeah. So I love that. Even that quick snippet of, you know, 30 seconds is – gives you a bit more information so i uh no i thoroughly enjoy that side and i was doing for a while there the three photos and then the video recording but i'm just going to get rid of the photos uh and yeah. just go video because i, I do you can screenshot the best bit of the video anyway correct like if it's in the right position just screenshot it and take it yeah, yeah i think i'm going to do that as now as well and i'm Starting to get cameras now. If I find something that's okay with rechargeable batteries, yep. and I'm just recharging everything. In the beginning, I wasn't, and I think I had Aldi cameras. I just wanted the cheapest one you could get because I was putting them on Stay public us, land, yeah. and yeah, and I was I was chaining them to trees as well and padlocking them. But yep. uh, and I was trying to keep them in spots where people just wouldn't go. But you never know. Yeah. But I think I only ever got one or two people on them, and people would just wave or whatever and just keep walking i've only ever found i think maybe what yeah one or two in my time as well it's always funny seeing them i have never seen one and maybe yeah. I, I don't know how i haven't like i don't in fairness you don't look for them do you when you're looking for no. deer you're not looking for trail cameras like so you're not you're not looking at every uh tree around going is there something on there but yeah i've never seen one or paid that much attention to that either Especially with public land, like I was, I was getting boosted up, and I was climbing trees to put them in and stuff to make sure people wouldn't find them. Yeah, okay. I was worried people, and I didn't really care about the camera. I just didn't want them to take my photos. <laughs> like, yeah, the cameras were only like a hundred bucks yep. from Aldi, and and they like they're dead now. But I think they probably lasted maybe the best one probably lasted four years. The last one definitely lasted probably three. So for a hundred bucks, I was I was happy with that. I got some nicer ones now that I put on the private places, but yep. yeah, some um, I love them. I I love them so much. They just they keep me so motivated that that that's out there. You know, you if you were there at the right time, the night, right place, that could be you. You could find that yep. animal, and yeah, that's a that's a big push for me. No, I like them. I uh, that's the one thing I don't like about the Ridgeline trail camera. Like the quality is great, 
I love the fact you can open it up, position it, see the actual the screens against the unit, so it's not on the mm-hmm. door like some of the other ones. I think the Audi ones were like that, where it's on the yeah. door you got to open up and you can't sort of get that spot. Um, yep. But there's no lock, so yes. anyone can just come up, unclip it, and take your memory card, and that's devastating to me. That I, I don't want that to happen. I, the value is in what's on the cards, not yeah. so much the camera because, what, you get a $100 camera, it's two cases of beer. Like in the yeah. scheme of things, it's not that much. It's You sit there and I just go, I don't want to lose what is on that camera and just that would drive me insane. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's nothing worse like when I go to a camera and like the cards just corrupt it on me. Oh. just infuriates me or there's like, you know, 3,000 photos of a spider that's made a home on the lens. <laughs> oh, kills me. Or, or when I was starting, I'd, I'd set it up and not realise that the, tr- the little branches in front would flicker and set yeah. the camera off. So, I'd just get, you know, a couple of thousand photos of a windy day. And, oh. I found the sensitivity is all over the place. You can have two identical cameras and have them both on medium sensitivity and or whatever it's called and, man, one will pick up something so far away compared to the other. Like they're, yeah. they're really different. It's sometimes a bit mind-blowing and it, maybe it's just the cheaper cameras uh, compared to the the more expensive ones, but it's that juggle, isn't yeah. it? It is always in my mind, unfortunately, on public land that, you know, people may not do the right thing all the time and it's uh, we shouldn't have to think like that, but, I mean – doesn't matter what you do. There is people that are going to break the break the law, do the wrong thing, and it's just the way of the world, isn't it? So yeah, especially when you leave them alone in the bush, there's no one around to see yeah. them. People are bad enough in car parks, and yep. let alone the bush. So, but yeah, like I'm, I'm the same. Like I used to lock them up and, and try and hide them and all sorts. But it is what it is. But I just like the idea that they're out there hunting for me. Like they're out there scouting while I'm at home. Yep. And I, I find that cool. Like I've been to some spots in the state forest where I thought, like, there's nothing here, but it was at the end of the day and I'm like, I've got to put it somewhere, you know. So just put it on a tree and in a little valley and hope for the best and then you come back and there's like, there's red deer in here. Like I had no idea. I didn't see any scat. I didn't see any signs, rub trees, nothing. You're like, okay, they just passed through this area. You know, all right, that's another piece to the puzzle. Yep. And then off you go again. You know, oh, I just love that they're there when I'm not doing work for me. No, it's pretty cool to see some of that footage that you just you'd never see, and it's yeah. exciting. I get I I get super pumped up to grab cameras. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. I you know I went the last time I went to the Snowies. Uh, sorry, with the family, I should say. We went down there and stayed in Airbnb, and and that's all I was down there for. It was the family trip, but I wanted to check the cameras. <laughs> They'd been out for a few months and I was just dying to get the footage. And uh, so I shot off early one morning and just grabbed them. I don't, I don't think I even took the rifle. But uh, it's so exciting. It's like a – it's almost I relate it to my Christmas day opening up presents and seeing what's, you know, what's there. That's just – it's so cool. But, mate, the rut is here. We are, like, in prime time at the moment. Have you got a couple of hunts coming up? What are you doing for it? Yeah, I've got – my brothers and my dad are going out this Friday, but I don't think I can go. So they're going to a spot uh, uh, where the um, the fruit trees are and they're going to go down and no doubt clean up, I'd say, a nice a nice fallow buck or two, which is all right. I've already got a nice one from there. It was sort of my first, I guess, buck that wasn't a spiker. So I've got him just as a Euro mount. But, yeah, they'll go down there and I reckon they'll get something pretty good it's a it's a weird spot where there's not many places to hunt this is one of the few so it's it very almost no pressure uh, and they're like clockwork the deer down there so i think they'll they'll come home with something pretty good we've we've had nights where we've shot three or four in a night just spotlighting and thermal and stuff not um but we've we've hunted some good ones on there as well so i think uh i think they'll be all right uh, and then I haven't booked anything else in yet, but um, I've done three trips now. Uh, I haven't heard any noise yet, but we just had yesterday a nice big cold front come through. So hopefully this weekend if I can get out. Uh, I don't really plan stuff too far in advance because most of the places that I can go, I can just 
flick a message and just head out and, and I can just run out. It's only an hour to get there, sit for the afternoon and then just drive back and I'm I'm back home, you know, before the kids are in bed. So uh, I'm pretty lucky like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm keen as. I, mean, I just want to hear some roars. I've, I haven't heard a lot of them before. I've heard them in the state forest uh, and I've heard a couple on private, but Back in the old Pennsylvania days, uh, I got onto a, a really good fellow that was just going crazy, and it was an amazing thing to. And we got pretty close to it, and just to hear them roar like that was, was yeah, it was a bit freaky. Like in the beginning, we were like, "Nah, we're going to be careful. We're walking into a dude with a a big speaker or something, a game caller or something." He's calling some hunters into him like we were like be careful you know someone might pop out of the bushes and then we end up finding a, a nice big fallow but you know as it goes with public land he was probably three meters the wrong side of the creek on the farmer's property so we just sat and just watched him and off he went into the hills and we just kept calling to him and that was it he was never coming back but yeah, I'll get out. I'll get out probably next weekend. I think that's fun though. Like I had uh, the last trip, I uh, got a, a spiker. But the day before, oh sorry, no, that same morning, he um, we, there was one croaking. So it was really early, and he we were back and forth for twenty minutes, and then you could hear him coming in, and then he'd back off and come in, and we just kept going until he took off. But I did, we didn't even get eyes on him, but. It was yeah. so much fun. It's such. I think this time is really exciting because you, the footage, like not just the animals that are getting taken and, and people getting their first and the stories and that's bloody cool, but then the footage of them fighting and people capturing, yeah. capturing them croaking and it's yeah. it's awesome. And I'm just – I was very lucky. I said I just, I'm addicted to that croaking now and – I got down and was able to hear a few for the last trip and I'm going away again. So I'm excited to hear hopefully them. And then that's – I'm also going to um, a forest where there's reds up there and I'm really keen. I haven't heard roaring before, so I'm dying to hear them this year just because I haven't had it in person and I'm, I'm such an addict for the croaking. It's uh, a yeah. little scary, mind you. I sit there and go, what will I be like when I hear a red? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've I've only heard reds uh, from a distance, like from from maybe a, another valley away. Um, I've I've never had one up close roaring, but yeah, I think it would be exciting. But I think it would almost be a little bit scary at the same time. Like they're they such a big animal, big big and interesting thing. And I don't even think like when I tell my friends about it, like about this time of year, because most only a couple of my friends are interested in hunting and. And I don't think most people even know that it exists, that first of all, that the deer exist in Australia, like people don't even know, and then that they make these crazy noises, like, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting thing. It's so cool. I actually took my wife just up to the local deer farm to hear the, the fellow croaking up there because oh, it's nice. just... A for me because I was like, oh, I want enough of what they're doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and B, uh, yeah, 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 pretty much. <laughs> and uh, not that I can go anywhere around here anyway, but it was just more to see what's going on and just try oh, and yeah. pattern them with some weather and, and in the yeah. local area in case I ever get lucky enough for some access. And I said to the wife, she'd never heard it. And she's one of the things I keep saying to her, and I love going bush, and the last camping trip was amazing because I'm laying there in bed listening to them croaking around us on the last morning yeah. and going, this is awesome. And she's a massive camper, but I said, you'll love just that experience. Like, she's never going to be a hunter. I know that, and that's yeah. fine. I've got no issue with that, but I know she will love that experience and hearing that. So I uh, took her along to hear it, and she thought it was pretty cool, and I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll have to get out into an actual forest when they're – there's a few going off, not just this one on a yep. farm. So that was uh, a step in the right, right direction to get out more, I think, maybe, hopefully, yeah. if she's listening. <laughs> yeah. Hint, hint. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky like that, that I can just do run and do arvo trips. Like that's that's been a big thing for me to be able to step it up the, the amount of times I can get out there because I find it so like it's so rough for guys, especially they live in the city. And they're coming out, you know, it's three, three plus hours to get to a forest. 
So that's a huge chunk of time. That means you're definitely camping. Yep. Uh, that's that's hard. Then you're asking your family to look after the kids or whatever it is. It's a big mission. So for me to just run out in the Arvos and come back is, yeah. It's yeah, you're laughing. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Nice. And look, I get why people are so protective of private because of that. I would be too. I get it. Like, you know, it's one of those yeah. it's one of those things that, you know, you want to do the right thing by the farmer and you don't want to lose that access. And I completely understand that side of it. So it's uh, Yeah, that's what I think the thing is with, with private I see a lot of people struggle with getting on to, to private property. And the thing I think that's worked for me is just understanding that that it's a fair trade. Like I see a lot of people say, like, I'll pay, I'll pay, you know, I'll, I'll give you money and beers. And I don't feel that that really works that well. I think it's a little bit desperate in a way, uh, as where I take the other way of, of thinking, I'm doing you a favour. You, you obviously don't want to shoot these things. You know I do, but my ammo, it's my fuel, it's my gun, it's my licence, my insurance, all that, it's my time. So I, I see it as a fair trade and I kind of treat it like that. Um, I don't really – I'll help out here and there. You know, I fed a cat on the weekend and looked after the, the lady's cat for her and things like that, but I'm not I'm not paying or anything. I'm, I, I see my time as being quite valuable. And I think if you go in with that mentality of I'm here to help, this is a fair agreement, uh, we're both getting something out of this. I think that will that'll help people change the way they probably speak and think. And and then the other thing I reckon is following their rules. Every place that I hunt at has different rules. You know, some of them, one of them which is weird, the the block with the fallow on it, um, with with all the fruit trees, uh, we we don't shoot foxes on it, which is which yeah. I was just I was thought the same thing. I'm like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And then he sort of explained to me, he's like, well, we don't have sheep or cattle farmers around here and we want to keep the rabbit numbers in check. So yeah, if okay. you shoot all the foxes, the rabbits are going to eat the bottom, the roots of my trees, yep. and then I'm going to have problems. I thought, oh, okay, he's he's using the feral animals to his advantage against other feral animals. <laughs> I yeah, thought, yeah. okay, cool. He knows his land and he knows what's happening in his area. And now that I'm there, I'm like, yeah, I rarely see a rabbit here. I've seen probably two or three, and I see a couple of foxes around, and it's working. Yeah, you know, I'm not all for it. You know, if it was my land, I think I'd be shooting them all, but I definitely get his play by doing it. And, yeah, I just really follow their rules. I reckon that's a big one. Yeah, mate, makes sense. So yeah. really appreciate your time coming on the podcast tonight because it is a uh, pretty peak season and, you know, we're all flat out. So I do appreciate you giving up your time. Mate, um, hats off to you taking over. I know you've been doing it for a while now, but uh, also, you know, f- continuing with the group and, you know, hopefully really respecting what Gibbo did and whatnot. I didn't get the pleasure to meet him, but uh, all the stories have been – everyone speaks very highly of him. So um, yeah. I'm glad that you sound like a great bloke and I've loved what I've heard tonight from you, so I think it's in good hands going forward. So keep doing uh, great things with that page. I'm sure everybody that's listening to the podcast knows that page as well, so I'm not even going to say <laughs> – we don't even need to plug it, but, uh, yeah. but yeah. mate – Mate, all the best for the right. Hopefully you get out there and, oh, I should say the raw and, and get some reds, but uh, really appreciate yeah. your time and, yeah, best of luck. Hope uh, yeah. hope you have some fun out there. Thanks for having me. I've, this is the first podcast I've done, so it's been uh, it's been interesting. It's been a lot easier than I thought, so thanks for making it a, a nice, easy experience. Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you say that. I, uh, I always just say it's just a chat. <laughs> when people yeah. say oh, yeah, it's a chat, no, I like talking to people. I like meeting new people and I love hearing people's stories and how they got to where they have and, you know, hearing similarities and differences. So it's always uh, always fun and, and informative. There's always something I pick up. I go away from each podcast going, oh, take that away out of that. So uh, yeah. I appreciate when guests come on and, and share. So, mate, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, listeners, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. If you have a topic, guest, question or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast, shoot us an email, australianhuntingandbeyond at gmail.com. Alternatively, find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time.